Uh, I'm Elaine Cato with California Campus Compact, and um, these webinars that we're doing are a partnership between Campus Compact of the Mountain West, California Campus Compact, and Utah Campus Compact. Uh, before we jump into the content of today's webinar, I'm going to just go over a few logistics um, on our Zoom platform for those of you who might be new to Zoom. Um, if you put your cursor down towards the bottom of your screen, you will see some, hopefully see some things pop up. Um, one is a Q&A, um, a, a box that says Q&A. If you have any questions for the panelists during the webinar, um, you can type your question in here because you will all be muted. Uh, during the presentation portion of this webinar. So we encourage you to ask any questions. Some may be answered along the way, but if not, we will have time at the end uh, for your questions to be addressed at that point in time. But throughout the webinar, you can use that um, Q&A box to type in any questions that you have. And if you know they're directed towards one particular speaker, you can indicate that as well. That would help us out. Um, Something else, and I know we'll have people coming on um, uh, continually, probably, as the webinar goes on. But as I said, you're going to be muted um, throughout the whole thing, just because there are um, quite a few folks registered for this. Another feature on the bottom of your screen should be the chat uh, box. And if you have any technical challenges, feel free to chat. Uh, a message to either, um, well, you'll see my name up there and you can send it to myself um, or to Piper McGinley in our office who's also uh, monitoring the chat box. Um, you can move the photos of the presenters around. If you don't like where they're located, you can just click drag um, those little photo boxes somewhere else on your screen. Um, and our presenters will be advancing. What you're seeing is the start of their PowerPoint. You'll um, be able to uh, see that they will be changing the slides. So you don't need to worry about anything about that. Uh, also, I want to let you know that um, Probably within a couple of hours after this webinar, um, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, and so if you wanted to watch it again, you could do a repeat. Um, also, uh, within the week after this webinar, we'll um, be sending out the link to the slides. So the resources that are shared in here um, Anyway, the, the resources that are shared as part of this slideshow um, will, um, you'll get that, just so don't worry. And we'll repeat this at the end because I know there are still people signing and logging in. Um, and so someone just chatted in that the um, Q&A box, the chat box might appear in a different location for you. It may be at the top of your screen. For me, it's at the bottom of my screen. If you can't see it right now, just move your cursor around and you should find where that list of um, options are. Um, let's see. Also, probably following this webinar um, within 24 hours, you'll also probably get some type of evaluation form and we'd appreciate you filling that out so we can get your feedback and any ideas you have for future topics. Um, so, on to the content portion. Um, we, and we're scheduled for an hour and a half, so we'll have at least an hour of content and then 15 to 20 minutes for you to ask, to do Q&A. And so we know that many of you are engaged in study abroad programs or thinking about designing international experiences for your students. And we wanted to make sure, um, we want to make sure that we're inviting students to experiences that are thoughtfully created and intentionally planned with community partners. So we invited some people that we believe are doing some outstanding work in this area to share their practices and thoughts with you. So our session um, today, Emergent Immersion, a community engagement model featuring the University of San Diego and their partners in this work. I'm going to um, let each of our presenters introduce and facilitators introduce themselves in a little bit more detail um, and tell you about their roles. 
in a bit, but briefly, our facilitators and leaders on this are uh, Chris Nive and John Loggins from the Mulvaney Center for Community Awareness and uh, Social Action at the University of San Diego. Uh, another presenter is Dr. Uh, Kira Espiritu, the Director of the Office of International Study, uh, Studies Abroad at the University of San Diego. We also have Stacy Williams, who's the Director of Education with Pacific Discovery. And we have Rafiq Mohammed, who's the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at California State University, San Bernardino. So I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to, I believe, get us started. Uh, with the webinar. Thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, this is my very first webinar, so um, apologies in advance. I'm used to gauging audience response, um, and I can't do that here, so this is going to be a unique and, and fun experience for me. Uh, I'm extra grateful for you all taking the time uh, out of your busy days uh, to join us, uh, as we wanted to present you something that we think is very uh, important to the work of community engagement and how we immerse ourselves in community. Uh, you'll see right off the bat, we uh, stunning you all with a Facebook-worthy picture of one of our students in Jamaica with uh, wonderful students. And I think oftentimes when our students come back, uh, they have a hard time expressing what their experience was. And I think they sum it up best by uh, acknowledging kind of the, the important things to them, but kind of oftentimes the superficial stuff. And it comes across as these pictures. Uh, but the real work, I think, comes when you see uh, the same student kind of in the thick of it like you know there's all this chaos and action and activity around but how do we uh, maximize that space how do we get them to be thinking about uh, their own personal work uh, how it's connected to the community power dynamics that exist around them and uh, hopefully that's what we are going to be exploring uh, this afternoon with you all um, just as a reminder for why you all are here this was ripped straight from the website of what we have promised to present to you uh, I'm just going to read it very quickly just so you are all on the same page. Uh, access has long been a topic of discussion in international education as professionals determine how to attract more diverse student populations into international opportunities. While this is important, it is increasingly critical to develop inclusive practices in advising, serving, and supporting students from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds as their participation in international activities increases. As we diversify student populations, we need program offerings and reflective experiences that invite students to live with greater social consciousness from host engagement, relationships with one another, and lives back at home. International opportunities can widen our gaze, seeing new realities while illuminating our identities and place in the world. This session explores how to integrate this type of identity development into programs and what often happens when you do. And as you can see from that description, I think we can hone in on specific points uh, from access to um, social consciousness to personal development. What we're going to try to do is uh, share how uh, taking up this work of being very mindful of our students' development and our personal growth uh, invites uh, diverse populations and diverse groups into the programs and vice versa. As we invited and started to receive more diverse populations, how it informed and shaped how we take on uh, identity development and uh, social consciousness uh, uh, raising. Um, how we define immersion with this group is immersion is an approach to community-based learning that is intentional in its framing, rooted in relationship, committed to self-interrogation and inquiry, and mindful of power dynamics, historic and presence. Uh, the core questions we're gonna be examining and sharing with you today are, how is this a practice? How do we take it up as a practice? And how is it inclusive? Uh, we've broken down those kind of key elements of our definition into different buckets. Um, and you can see the list of who's going to be going over what. We all have some shared experiences with this, so we hope for our closing thoughts in the Q&A, we'll all be able to participate in various uh, uh, spaces in the conversation. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Kira. Uh, who will be talking about intention, and uh, I'm going to be managing the slideshow, so when they say next and things like that, that's just my cue to, to move forward. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Hello from San Diego. Um, as Elaine mentioned, uh, my name is Kira Spiritu, and I'm the director of the Office of International Studies Abroad here on campus at the University of San Diego. And um, I thought I would first start off by offering you a little bit of context, um, just because of my role here in terms of the way that study abroad programs are 
done or traditionally done here on campus. Um, so my office is part of the International Center here, and we serve as the hub for any sort of international activities across campus. Um, so we have over 80 different um, opportunities for students. Um, they're all over the world, and they range from short-term programs to semester-long programs. But if you were to take a look at sort of our standard profile, um, you'd see a pretty stereotypical view of study abroad. You know, it's the middle to upper class students um, and they're studying abroad in Europe for the most part. Um, this may be the same for uh, many of your campuses, um, but it may not be. But I just wanted to give you some background in terms of um, knowing where we're coming from in, in terms of doing this work. So um, we are an Ashoka Changemaker campus, and so we're really actively trying to change the models of how we do study abroad programming. And slowly over time, the changes are happening because we're working to shift um, our, our programming to be able to offer more opportunities for true engagement in the sense that we're going to talk about it today. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with John Loggins and Rafiq Mohammed, um, both for a while now, um, on the uh, Jamaica program, and they will talk to you about that um, in a little while. Um, and the, that program in and of itself is, is truly a model, I think, of, of our community engagement and emergent immersion and, and what we mean by that. Um, additionally, um, as an example that I can draw from, our office also works with a faculty member in the political science department um, who started a program in South Africa, largely modeled, I would say, after the Jamaica summer abroad program. And so we're really trying to shift the standard paradigm of study abroad to be more engaging and more intentional, but we understand that obviously this model may not work for all locations and we understand that the work is of course going to take time and, and patience um, because as you'll hear in a little while, it's it's really about building, starting with the relationships and, and building from those. Um, so with all of that being said, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the idea of intention um, in terms of the work we do. So um, if we look up the word intention uh, in the dictionary, we can find the various meanings that are there on your screen. So an aim that guides action, meaning or significance, or an act or instance of determining mentally upon some action or result. And I think that if we think about what that word means, um, I have broken it down by various components, if you wanna call them that, in terms of what um, is sort of needed when you're thinking about um, setting up these programs or, or continuing them um, on your campuses. So if we first start with intention and location, um, in setting up types of programs like this, you need to think ahead of time about the location. So you wanna ask yourselves, where are we going? Um, so which locations uh, do we currently have on our list, you know, maybe on your campus that may be able to lend themselves to this type of program or experience? Do we not have any? Do we need to start looking into those um, options? So um, we were lucky here in that Jamaica, when I started in my role, Jamaica was sort of existent and, and handed to me and and we've worked over the years to enhance the program um, but so ask yourself that question in terms of where in terms of capacity um, would you be able to do this work um, and then ask yourself why are we going there so the why is what about that particular location um, is making it a viable opportunity for the engagement um, and the deep true immersion um, of your students and faculty in that particular location. You'll also want to ask, um, how did you get there? So, the, or how can you, if you don't already have it? So programs like this are usually developed um, after somebody has formed a relationship with a, a person or a group of people or a community abroad. Um, so talk to, think about yourselves, you know, um, who is your network? How are you connected? Um, where are you connected? And those can help kind of be guiding forces. Because if, if we look at our Jamaica program, John was connected really through his time in the Peace Corps there um, and kind of got the ball rolling. Um, and then if you look at our South Africa program, the professor who leads that had lived there, had done a lot of research there for quite some time and had formed relationships long before he thought of developing uh, that particular location as a study abroad opportunity for our students. Um, if you look at the intention in terms of recruitment and marketing, um, we really need to be intentional about how we market the, um, the programs to the students to ensure that 
you're really reaching a wide variety of students um, because oftentimes uh, if, if we start developing these programs, um, you may find yourselves preaching to the choir, uh, for lack of a better word, um, to the students who are already maybe predisposed to participate in a program like this, where we're asking them to step out of comfort zones, asking them to really truly engage with people on a human level, um, and really want to just maybe sit with people um, and be okay with that. So. Um, we understand though that these types of programs are probably not, they're not for everybody. Um, but we also understand the value in them and that maybe while they're not for everybody and maybe a student might join in not knowing exactly what they're getting into. So that particular student or group of students may need a little bit more help um, in terms of navigating the journey that they'll find themselves on. But we believe at USD that, you know what, it's okay to be uncomfortable um, because it's in the discomfort um, where the growth and the real change um, we think can occur. So ask yourselves, who are you reaching? Um, how are you reaching them? Um, we find in our office really that flyers don't really do the trick anymore. Um, we're needing to either go to, you know, out into the residence halls at nine o'clock at night with pizza um, and talk to students and meet them where they are and not wait for them to come into the office. Do a lot on social media, do a lot of word of mouth. Um, so it just sort of depends on the dynamics of your campus and what might work for you there. Um, in terms of intention and design, thinking about the design of your program is, is really critical because I think without putting some for, um, forethought into this particular element, programs can fail. Um, and in that, it's not enough to say, oh, um, I have this relationship with this person, it'll just work out. We'll just be able to figure that out. Um, because when you're doing the hard work of of really truly engaging and and um, not being a typical um, or tourist or outside observer um, without some structures in place um, that can get really overwhelming and so and so really being mindful and intentional about about program design is is really useful so you want to think about things like program length um, how long is your program? Uh, does the site support the needs of the group? Are there facilities? Are there opportunities for engagement? Um, what do those opportunities look like? Um, you may not know until you get there, um, but you at least have to start with something. So the idea even in your head that an opportunity could exist um, is, is useful and, and necessary. Um, in terms of community engagement, how will your students engage with the community? Are there structured opportunities that already exist? Um, or will these need to be created? Um, who are you connected to? So thinking about your different range of network um, it, within a community. Um, are you connected to people that might have inroads to schools? Are you connected to people who might have inroads to hospitals or government organizations? Um, because really it's these local uh, community members and your local connections that will be the key to designing a program like this. Um, Along with design, I also think it's really important to think about the leadership. Um, and when I say leadership, I, I mean, I mean it in a sense of, yes, okay, a faculty member or a staff member leading the program, but also not just in terms of logistics. I mean, I think that um, being able to do this kind of work, but also helping navigate the process for students, this, this isn't going to be something that everybody is going to be a fit for. Um, it's important to have people on site who are, you know, from the university who can not just handle the logistics, um, you know, details as housings, um, you know, when the buses are coming, where you're going to go visit, but the many different moving parts of the programs. But also, it's really important to think about the need for that person or whoever's going to be in that role to be willing to engage at a deeper um, and it's more often a more personal uh, level with students than what traditionally may occur in a in a faculty-led short-term program. Um, that may be, you know, if it's a traditional program, it may be, you know, they go, they teach for a couple hours, and then maybe there's an on-site staff member who deals with everything else afterwards. Um, but when you're there and you're in community with your students, things are going to come up. So being able to engage authentically with the community is hard, um, but and it, and it can bring up feelings, not just for yourself, but um, for for uh, the rest of the people around you. And so it's important to have a leader or somebody in a leadership position who can negotiate all of that and, and hold the space um, that's needed for the students um, to have a quality experience as well. 
Um, in terms of intention and process, uh, we here like to use the word co-creation. I've learned that from my colleagues, John and Chris and Rafiq. Um, and so in developing these programs, uh, USD really takes the approach that these programs are going to be developed in partnership. Um, so I've said that a lot, but it's, it's really truly about the partnership and in with our community members. So we are actively working to avoid going to locations thinking that something needs to be fixed. Um, and we try to allow for space for natural conversations and relationships to happen organically. Um, because you know, you're not gonna have the same students every time. So things might change, dynamics might change. Um, but for, for them to, out of those relationships, out of those conversations, that's where opportunities for engagement can occur. And they may look different every single time you go. Um, I think something really important that uh, we struggled with in earlier years here at USD, but um, it, we've we worked through it, and I think we have a pretty good model working, is how to keep and continue and sustain these programs. So um, when you have a program that starts with maybe a passion um, from a particular faculty member or a group of people, that's great because there's a lot of momentum behind that. But what happens if that particular faculty member and those particular cannot go, for example, one year? Those relationships were built with that faculty member. And so if that faculty member is not there, a lot of times if you don't bring in like, bring in like a centralized office like our office, um, things just may get lost at the wayside and the program just might not run. And so we had that experience early on um, with our program in South Africa. Um, so what we learned from that is that as you go along, it's important to bring other faculty members who may not necessarily be um, wanting to lead right away, but just exposing them and, and other members of the community on your campus to the program that exists so that in the event that something has to change or faculty members have to shift out, um, there may be other people in those places that can take up the work. Because one of the things, obviously, is you want to continue the momentum on your campus to the students, but one of the detrimental things that happens when you're in engagement and relationships with the community is that if you don't show up anymore, um, your relationship with that community has been damaged and you've worked so hard to try to build that that it's really important that those relationships are fostered, valued, cared for, attended to, um, even when you're not on site. It's continuous check-in with people um, back to wherever that local site is. Um, but also, you know, they come to rely on you coming year to year and, and maintaining those relationships in person. So it's really important that those key community relationships be continued and be valued and have a structure set up um, so that if, if a particular faculty member is tied to the program and can't go, that the program and all of those relationships can remain intact. So with that, my colleague Chris will now talk more specifically about relationships and community building. Well, thanks, Kira. Um, it's uh, great to be with uh, on this webinar with you all, and it's I appreciate you taking the time to be with us, and it's great to be with colleagues on this panel. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share some thoughts on this idea of um, partnership and relationships that challenge in uh, in equity. And you know, many of us who are using the framework of Carnegie and, and anchor institution language that focus on democratic and reciprocal partnerships. And I think while um, kind of the reason why I drew this. This graph was while many campuses are striving for democratic and reciprocal community ties, the concept of equity is sometimes an afterthought. Um, while many of our elders of our work considered equity as kind of central to building relationships that are democratic and reciprocal. So that's kind of why my graph looked that way. And I couldn't figure out a cool way to put color on the left side. So that's what you're gonna look right there. And, and I think, you know, I wanted to share some uh, several formative moments for me and how I have come to view and experience uh, community partnerships. And the first was learning from our founding director, Judy Rahner, who always stressed this idea of co-created community identified needs. And even though, you know, that, that concept is more mainstream now, back then there were only a handful of practitioners in our work that formed partnerships that were truly equitable. So I just wanted to give it a space to kind of recognize that. And of course, this list is long. I just wanted to name a few. Um, and, you know, folks like Nadine Cruz, who talked about, uh, you know, community members and community wisdom holders. And she even had, you know, community members grading her student papers. And these were workshops in, you know, the early 2000s, right? And of course, Richard Cohn from USC. 
uh, and all the work that he's doing in terms of, or what he did and continues to do in terms of challenging um, how we build equitable partnerships and making sure that um, what we learn is continued and not, uh, you know, a lot of the lessons learned are, are implemented in our current work. Um, so those were, you know, some of the early formative folks um, and moments. And I, I do want to recognize uh, this, this important uh, publication that California Campus Compact uh, put together, Community Voices, uh, California Campus Compact Study on Partnerships. Um, so, you know, and then over the years, as we continue to build relationships in the community, many other individuals taught me what reciprocity looked like in action. Um, you know, again, folks, photos on this slide um, and, and so many others. So, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure I, I took a pause to, to recognize that. Um, we can go to the next slide, John. I think that, that one was your, your... Oh, is that is that my last slide? Yeah. Photo of the house? Okay. Cool. Well, then the homework is then that you all will have to go to that publication and uh, look at the photo of the house. Um, Elaine knows that diagram of the house. Um, so another key moment was when John and I asked to do, was, you know, we were asked to do this faculty workshop on international community engagement. And this was this aha moment. And um, it was, you know, how do you do this work in an international context? And so John and I kind of looked at each other and we said, well, you would do this work as if you were doing it in your own backyard, right? These same principles apply. No parachuting in. Um, you know, these same principles of partnership development, whether you were doing it across the ocean or, you know, in your neighborhood. These were the things that were kind of really important to us. So again, um, I, I think a lot of that is highlighted in that collective voice um, publication. Uh, that was put together by Campus Compact, but then I know many of you who are on this webinar consider this as a practice and how you're doing this work, but those were some of the formation, important formation moments for me as, as I think about um, the importance of relationships and building uh, equitable community ties. Um, you know, I also want to share another important moment that um, I think many of you are experiencing, certainly Campus Compact, uh, most definitely California Campus Compact, and USC in general are these ideas of all these designations like being an Ashoka change maker campus, a Carnegie engaged campus, an anchor institution, and then of course being a member of California Campus Compact that is uh, like many of you probably rewriting our civic action plan. And two of the statements in the action plan, um, you know, are, are, are we're, we're putting a lot of intention behind. Uh, there are five, I believe. Um, two in particular that I think are relevant to our discussion today uh, is this idea of how do we empower our students, faculty, and staff, and community partners to co-create mutually respectful partnerships in pursuit of a just, equitable, and sustainable future for communities beyond the campus, nearby, and around the world. And then the other statement was um, how do we embrace our responsibilities as place-based institutions contributing to the health and strength of our communities economically, socially, environmentally, educationally, and politically. So as I was thinking about all of these uh, proclamations that show up in our work as we develop partnerships, um, you know, if we're not careful, I think, you know, Dick Cohn talks a lot about, you know, these will just basically become like bumper stickers if we're not in true mutuality. Um, so I've been reflecting a, a, a lot about this. And in particular, one of our latest articles uh, by a community member, his name is Rigo Reyes, who is part of uh, Chicano Park Steering Committee here in San Diego. He's the founder of the Amigos Lowrider Car Club, community wisdom holder. He has this article called um, Reflections as a Barrio Alist. And, and a few of the things he was struggling with as he does this work in his own community, um, I, I think are worth noting. Uh, he, he talks about the work um, working with and not for or to the community this idea of arrogance that sometimes comes from this work. Um, he has struggled with this idea that sometimes he feels he's an entertainer for privileged students. And then he wonders if he has created a dependency on the community he is committed to serve. And then John and I were at a, a community forum last night and one of our community partners, he, he uh, reflected, he says, you know, every September I know the goodwill dump truck in the form of faculty and students will be arriving to make a delivery of good intentions. And uh, you know, this, this happens um, often, especially as students and faculty get activated um, 
in terms of what they become aware about. So the full force of um, all the excitement and energy and purpose of doing this work uh, really reaches them. And so they want to burden, um, you know, themselves and, and really kind of take this on. And, and, you know, sometimes we have to recognize that community members have been working on these issues before us, they'll be working on it after us. And how do we factor in humility and curiosity in this work? So, you know, at, at minimum, we do this work rooted in relationships. Um, inequity still shows up quite a bit. And, um, you know, I, I've been thinking about this idea, how, how do we consider intent versus impact in this work? And I think how this conversation often goes is, um, when it doesn't land exactly how we intended, it sounds like, you know, I meant this. And then the other person says, yeah, but this is how I took it. Um, kind of reminds me of a lot of the Facebook dialogue I have with some folks I don't always agree with. But, um, I, you know, I think it illuminates how well-intentioned ideas and actions can land differently from its intent. And, you know, I thought a lot about this, especially in my role in title and how that shows up in partnership work. Um, you know, that recognizing that my role, my role and title shows up just as much as who I think I am as a unique person shows up. And I can't assume that in building partnerships that we are blind to titles and roles. So, you know, it kind of makes me think of that idea when people say they're colorblind, but I, I, you know, I guess that often comes at the expense of being culture blind. So um, I'll share uh, I guess I'll end by sharing what my good friend Jordan Flaherty, who is an, he's an author, journalist, and activist in New Orleans, uh, what he wrote uh, recently in his new book, uh, it's called uh, No More Heroes, Grassroots Challenges to the Savior Mentality. Uh, totally unrelated to what we're talking about at all. Just kidding. That's a joke. Um, and it's this idea of uh, decentering privilege in our partnership development work. And he argues that the best way to combat the savior mentality is to act collectively for systemic change in a way uh, that is accountable to the community's effect. So, and with that, I'll pass it on to, I believe, Stacy. No, oh, me. Oh, John. <laughs> I'm back. Um, thank you all. Uh, I really uh, appreciate uh, kind of the context and the framing of uh, the work that goes into being deliberate about how we, our attention to starting a program and uh, how mindful we are about the relationships that we're creating in, in the community. And I think if you think about it, em immersion as a practice, uh, you can kind of easily see how our roles as faculty and administrators and educators, uh, we need to be deliberate about those steps and, and incorporate into our practice. But I also think as, uh, as many of your centers probably are like ours, uh, rely a lot on student leadership um, and uh, are dependent on really cooperating with the partnerships. Uh, making sure that everybody's kind of on board in those first initial steps is important too. So I think it's really kind of uh, good work to see ourselves in this practice and how we take it up, uh, but to be mindful that, you know, everybody who's uh, involved in developing and creating these programs uh, need to kind of have that shared sense of, of ownership of, of this as a practice. And what I want to do right now is kind of maybe even uh, direct some of the attention on to how the students take up this practice when they're in the immersion experience. And, and a, a big part of that uh, comes in after we've kind of laid the groundwork for them, explain to them they're, they're coming to the community um, uh, not to fix it, uh, not as saviors, not to kind of perpetuate uh, some colonial idea that we have all the answers, but to actually put themselves into the community uh, to join and to learn. And uh, what comes up for them is very important and how they kind of uh, self-interrogate and, and are curious about what comes up is, is kind of the focus of uh, this piece of the practice. Um, taking up the practice, um, you know, why do we even want to do this and how do you convince students that this is an appropriate way to engage communities? Uh, I know, for example, Jamaica, uh, as much as I love it, um, there is a, a lot of thinking um, from faculty, uh, from parents who will often say like, well, why are we going to Jamaica in the first place? So what can you learn from Jamaica? Um, and that's where we want to focus on, on, on really saying that we're, we're relationship based. Uh, we have this wonderful opportunity to kind of learn a lot of different things. I mean, there's all kinds of cultural context, colonial history, historical knowledge that, that can be shared. Uh, but I think uh, the, the part that I'm going to examine is, is really how they bring themselves to the work and, and see community and see the beauty of it and not just think about it in a deficit-based lens. Like We're just going to go in and paint this school or this uh, particular facility needs all these different things that 
um, that we may be able to offer, uh, and I'm going to come in and, and fix it. Um, and how do we do that is by giving them space to get in where they fit in. Um, you know, we definitely have some partnerships that we explore with students, uh, but a lot of our partnerships uh, uh, steer us and lead us into friendships uh, and very familial ties, and, and our students have this really unique opportunity uh, to access community in, in a unique way. Uh, so if you are somebody who really likes music and um, we can find somebody that's really interested in sharing uh, how they take up music or if they, if you really like going to a club, um, you know, I'm okay with it, but don't just do it with USD students. Take advantage of going to those places with Jamaicans. And what we've been doing for the past 11 years now in Jamaica is kind of laying the foundation for our students to kind of have a, um, you know, a free range of, of experiences and opportunity to kind of do this work. And why it's important to do it here. Uh, I know there's lots of, we do a lot of this work, uh, Chris name that, you know, we see the work that we do in Linda Vista here in San Diego very much as we see the immersions that we do in Jamaica. But what's unique about international immersions, I think it provides a, a, a lot of room to grow. And you'll see I, I put that room to grow uh, in, in quotation marks and room being, uh, partly about the space that we're uh, occupying, like the, the, the room being Jamaica, and Jamaica being a place that I can kind of take off some of my blinders. Uh, we, I believe, get caught up in a lot in our stories. Uh, we tell ourselves that you know we live in the greatest country in the world, and uh, we don't have problems with uh, sexism or, uh, or race or class, um, and, for us to kind of challenge those notions means that we have to challenge some really uh, deeply held beliefs and stories that we have about our own country and about ourselves. Uh, when you take a student out of that context and put them in a new environment uh, like Jamaica um, or, or like South Africa or like Thailand, uh, you give them the space to kind of think about these things in, from a, an outsider's perspective. Um, and, and be able to really look and say like, oh, they can name a lot of issues that they'd be unwilling to or unable to name at home. And our role as helping them take up this practice is to the, help them make some of those connections. Uh, I mean, it's ultimately, that's kind of the purpose of why we're out there, I, I think. Uh, we definitely want to give learning opportunities for our students, but uh, I always like to anchor myself to purpose. And one of the purposes of why I stayed I've stayed in education for the last 15 years is because I believe that universities are here to be a public good. And what that public good looks like, again, is, is, is rooted in uh, anchoring yourselves and providing resources and, and connections for the community. Uh, you know, I, again, I think I tend to steer away from the notion of being transactional. Uh, you know, if we ever do a project, um, the relationships are, are always the focal point. Uh, we're going into the community partner, going into the school, thinking, uh, how do we build relationships? How do I get our students to fall in love with your students? How do we get that connection to make made? And service is the tool. Any product that we do, any kind of deliverable that we have is the gravy. I think uh, oftentimes in traditional service learning, um, um, there has, it has been the case that, you know, the transaction is the goal and the relationships is the gravy. Uh, and, and I think we like to try to flip that. And, um, you know, this is kind of rooted in some of our colleagues' uh, work. Uh, Tania Mitchell, I'm sure some of you know, um, and, you know, differentiates traditional service learning from critical service learning by uh, naming that, you know, all participants seek to redistribute power in the relationship. Uh, the cultivation of authentic relationships is crucial. And participants work from a social change perspective. That's uh, a lot different than a traditional service model to where you are uh, actively, um, you know, thinking about your course objectives and uh, uh, providing a service for the community. Uh, this gives us the space for them to really critically think about themselves and how they take up this work. Uh, and why that's important, again, thinking about that get in where you fit in, um, is that this is the space that students, I think, get to uh, really bring themselves to it. So I can't tell you what's gonna come up for a student when we take them to Jamaica. Um, you know, uh, initially when we started, when we were predominantly uh, majority culture, white, uh, affluent, and upper middle class students, you know, it, it was, you can kind of predict that there'd be some um, thoughts about being the other, uh, about power and privilege, uh, but that's not true for everybody. And then when we started to, 
to have more students of color and more students that uh, express themselves and identify in, in ways that are, uh, you know, not the, the majority uh, mainstream sense of identity. I don't like to use the word normal. Uh, they came up with different things. So what they're bringing in is completely different and their aspirations are a lot different. So uh, this model that I'm showing here is, is a leadership model that uh, I, I like to have our students consider and uh, personally consider as I take up the work. Like, you know, when we're holding space, uh, how do we bring ourselves into it? If you see on the left side of the U, uh, that's very much uh, how we bring ourselves to it, how we're open up, how we're willing to connect. And then at the bottom is really where I think all the magic happens. This is where when they're in the space, they're learning to connect, they're seeing that they can join and have a lot of access to a lot of their emotions. And uh, if supported properly, uh, we can offer a lot of support and direction and, and an acknowledgement of what they're going through as we help them kind of move through the other side uh, of that U and taking up that work, not just in Jamaica or, or South Africa, but how they can bring that work back at home, how they can actually continually see this as a practice that they can be engaged in uh, around joining and about being present and presencing yourselves in a specific community. Um, and this is a, from a, um, Otto Schramer's book, uh, Theory U. Uh, I think it's a, a wonderful dynamic. It's leadership based, but again, I think as we think about trying to redistribute power and social change, that's an important consideration to make. Um, I already know I'm kind of running low on time. So uh, we will, uh, you know, of course, distribute this out. But here's a, a quote that talks about the Sacred Heart and uh, kind of leaning into that discomfort that, that uh, Kira was mentioning earlier. I think, you know, it's, it's hard work to do when we ask our students to be present in the community uh, and put themselves out there. Because what emerges oftentimes is a very powerful um, and loving relationships. And loving relationships aren't always the easiest relationships to, to navigate. Um, and the last slide that I was going to show you it was to talk about Sugar and Sean, just very briefly. Uh, I mean, I can go through the list of a, a number of stories of, of our students, but when you think about our willingness to be, uh, to hold what emerges, uh, you have a, a dynamic where we've got a wonderful young student uh, named Tricia uh, on Sean, uh, who's there on the left in the pink shirt, uh, connect with a wonderful young woman named uh, Sugar, was her yard name at, at a place of safety. Uh, really connected on, on a human level, uh, kind of fell in love with one another in the sense that uh, Sean wanted to adopt Teresha. Um, and, you know, having the conversations with her in that space to ask, you know, like, is this something that you really can do? Why are you compelled to do this? Like unpacking all the motivations for it and then stepping into the work and saying, like, is this something that is doable? Uh, she went through that whole process uh, of trying to uh, adopt Sean. It was looking good. Uh, and then family members intervene and kind of stop that process, um, leaving uh, Sugar in kind of the detention uh, facility, uh, which is what the place of safety is, uh, where she unfortunately passed away uh, last year due to some health-related issues and uh, trying to abscond from uh, the place of safety, which is terribly heartbreaking and, and real. Uh, when you you know if, when we open up the opportunity and the possibility for our students to engage in real ways. Uh, they're going to engage in real ways. Um, and that doesn't always mean easy ways. I, I think, you know, this work can be very messy. And one of the things that I always want to advise and make sure everybody knows when they are taking up this practice is that, you know, I think every ounce of it is worth it. Um, but are we willing to kind of hold steady and do our work along with them? Uh, because, you know, I'm pretty certain I can take any student to Jamaica um, and let them have a very surface level experience and get great reviews. It's Jamaica. Uh, if I'm willing to push them and challenge them, uh, I'll still get those great reviews, but I'm putting more work and uh, uh, opening up a space for us to learn and grow in different and important ways uh, that I think we need to acknowledge and, and really start to lean into because I think uh, as we're trying to become more civically engaged and as we're trying to work towards uh, equity and reciprocal partnerships, this is how it looks. Uh, this is uh, the impact that you have to be willing to kind of go through in order to do this work. And I apologize for taking up more than my time. I'll pass it on over to my dear friend and colleague, Rafiq Mohammed. Uh, I think John just wanted me to say less. So, um, uh, well, I, I, I thank you all for joining us today. Um, and I, my name is Rafiq Mohammed. I'm the Dean of uh, Social Behavioral Sciences at Cal State San Bernardino. Uh, but I used to work at USD with John and Kira and Chris. 
Uh, and that's where um, the Jamaica program that John and Kira and Chris have mentioned uh, uh, originated. And I, I'll say this right now and get to it uh, in a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but we began the Jamaica program uh, really as an alternative to existing programs uh, with the intention of having a, a, uh, a study abroad experience that necessarily involved a greater degree of uh, community engagement that gave students opportunities to really connect with people from the community and uh, most importantly, learn from uh, people from the community, not just about where they were, but about who the students were. I think studies abroad provide students uh, a wonderful opportunity to critically examine themselves. Um, speaking of critical self-examination, uh, the first thing that I want to touch upon uh, is the this idea of self-interrogation that John introduced. Uh, and I wanted to, to, to turn the lens a little bit uh, onto faculty. As an introduction to this idea, I want to use this uh, quote from Cornell West, which I think uh, is illuminating. It's actually two different quotes of his that I fused together. But West uh, asks, what happens when you interrogate yourself? What happens when you begin calling into question your tacit assumptions and unarticulated presuppositions and begin then to become a different kind of person? It takes courage to interrogate yourself. It takes courage to look in the mirror and see past your reflection to who you really are when you take off the mask, when you're not performing the same old routines uh, and social roles. And I think um, this, this, this quote's an interesting way to introduce this idea of self-interrogation when it comes to faculty. Uh, because we as faculty, I think, are, are great at guiding students through this process of self-exploration, but we are very rarely asked to uh, consider ourselves and to ask how effective we are at turning that, that lens, that self-interrogation lens, uh, on ourselves. And, and this is a particularly important question when we're looking at how we engage students and how we make their learning experiences more relevant to them. Uh, next slide, please, John. Uh, a lot of the conversation today in higher education, at least for the past decade, uh, has revolved around this idea of high impact learning practices. Uh, and certainly relevant to this conversation, uh, some of the key aspects of high uh, impact learning practices revolve around community-based learning, uh, diversity studies, uh, and global learning and, and international immersive experiences through studies abroad. Um, the general idea behind HIPS or high impact learning practices is that students shouldn't just be treated as the recipients of knowledge, um, rather they should be kind of sent out to find knowledge and then the role of faculty becomes uh, that of a shepherd, you know, taking students out there to help them find knowledge and to help them process that knowledge that they uh, find. Um, one of the problems I see with HIPS, uh, and again related to this idea of uh, self-interrogation as, as it relates to faculty, is that fa is there's this presumption that faculty are, are somehow organically prepared to direct students in this transformation. Uh, that we somehow through our training uh, automatically have these tools to, to take students abroad, for example, and, and, and share this experience with them. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Uh, one of the impediments I see here, uh, next slide please, John, is what I uh, call the professorial gaze. Uh, and there's a paper that I think we're gonna make available to you that I've written in draft form that goes into more detail on the professorial gaze, so I won't uh, belabor it here. But uh, just simply put, the professorial gauge refers to uh, the manner in which we look at things as professors. And this idea that our academic training constructs us as the experts and invites us to view the other in kind of a passive form. Uh, and, and because we are constructed as experts, uh, we can become intimidated by not knowing and by not being the authority. Um, and, and this plays out, I think, very interestingly in, in, in studies abroad and immersive environments because our gaze uh, is challenged when we are asked to, for example, uh, accept community members as wisdom holders or as co-educators, uh, or when issues of diversity inclu and inclusion that maybe don't manifest themselves necessarily in the United States uh, present themselves in international settings, uh, or when ideas of social consciousness that, that don't match our frameworks uh, are introduced. Uh, a very quick example of this would be uh, looking at, for example, um, uh, in Jamaica, looking at gender roles. Uh, in the evening time, there's a very kind of uh, uh, remarkable uh, and stark division where men are out and about and women are nowhere to be seen. Uh, and for some faculty that we've had with us in Jamaica, they've been really challenged by this. Uh, they see it as, as, as their impulse is to see it as sexism or to see it as, as gender stratification when, if you dig deeper, uh, the, 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 the meanings are more complex. And so, uh, I'll be happy to talk more about that later uh, or, or, or something like that. In any case, um, I think that if we uh, prepare and encourage faculty to interrogate themselves and suspend their professorial gaze, uh, HIPS, uh, like immersive studies uh, abroad, can, can certainly be more effective. Um, uh, next slide, please, John. 
Um, this is just a quote from one of our students who, who was reflecting upon uh, the, the impact that, that this kind of release of gays had. The student wrote, I was told that by the time I left Jamaica, I would learn more about Jamaica from my house moms and the locals than I would in classes. I found this to be true. The people that I engaged with shared with me information and experiences that could not be taught in a book. And I think that that's a, a kind of very powerful manifestation of what happens when we uh, are willing to let go and let others be co-educators uh, for our students. Uh, next slide, please, John. Um, the, the next thing that I wanted to talk very briefly about as my time is running short is, is this idea of, um, of, of mindful, mindfulness of contextual dynamics in, devel in developing immersive, immersion experiences. Um, just as a quick backdrop, uh, I taught abroad in a large uh, study abroad program in Mexico 14 years ago or something like that. And, and, I, and, and from that, it was a great experience for me and for students, but there were two things that I saw uh, as problematic with how some studies abroad can be constructed. Uh, the first thing is that studies abroad often can function largely just as extensions of their host institution where students uh, exist in their university or an otherwise American bubble and don't necessarily get out and experience and learn from the community. Uh, and the second thing I've seen with some other studies abroad is that they can uh, be kind of rapidly moving sightseeing opportunities that aren't sub substantively connected to the place where the students are. Uh, so next slide, please, John. Uh, as we developed our Jamaica program, we were trying, we were trying to be very intentional uh, in, in steering away from this uh, in our program. Uh, and we wanted to students to understand uh, from the outset that if you uh, don't live in this place and if you're not from this place, you're a tourist. Uh, and I often say to students, I've been to Jamaica 30 times. Uh, I love Jamaica. Pardon me, that was a stopwatch. I, I love Jamaica. I love being in Jamaica. I feel at home in Jamaica. But ultimately, I know that I'm, I'm still a tourist and I have a blue passport that allows me to go home uh, whenever I want. Um, uh, but because I'm a tourist, I don't necessarily have to hold that gaze. I can try to suspend that gaze to invite more learning to come in. Um, and what we found as part of our Jamaica program is, is if we build a contextual curriculum that prepares students for what they will see, what they'll hear uh, and experience, uh, particularly when engaging with community members, it can be a, a powerful uh, learning experience. Uh, there in the middle, which I will bypass, is another quote from one of our students who's reflecting upon uh, uh, how uh, that opportunity empowered her in, in Jamaica. Uh, next slide, please, John. Um, this is just a, a summary of some of the things that uh, we found useful in developing the Jamaica program, understanding that it's not one size fits all. We did find that these, uh, these particular uh, bullet points here uh, were, were, were helpful in, in disabusing, disabusing students of the idea that theirs is the only history that matters, uh, and also understanding that immersive studies abroad can serve as an ideal way to kind of connect the dots of history and ask students to widen their gaze and take a more critical look at themselves. Um, I know that we are up against the clock, so I will uh, allow you to look at that on your own time. Um, but, but again, just to underscore the idea that intentionality and, and being deliberate uh, is important uh, when you're constructing the program, and making sure that students have a sense of where they are and why they're there and why listening to these people matters uh, is critical. Uh, just the last thing that I wanted to point out, uh, uh, deliberate design can pay dividends. This is a quote, again, from one of our students, because I think they say it better than I ever could. Um, uh, the connections that we that were made with the Jamaican people during my time there is something that cannot be bought or replaced. I can always learn how to make rice and peas. I can always go to another crystal clear beach, but people are what made my experiences in Jamaica worthwhile. This trip helped me realize that there's so much more to learn if I simply opened my mind up to it. I never knew what was beyond home. I never considered learning what was beyond America. Uh, that's the privilege that comes with being born an American, I guess. Uh, again, this type of learning and reflection I don't think would be possible unless we are willing to suspend our professorial gaze and invite students to learn from community members. Uh, I yield the floor to Stacy. Fantastic. Everyone, thanks for being here and sticking with us. So the last component that we have for how to be intentional in a framing and create emergent immersion experiences is being mindful of power dynamics present. So a little bit about my context. My name is Stacy. I have a master's in higher education leadership. So I'm moving from a student affairs social justice center context and now work at a gap year organization, Pacific Discovery. So we run semester programs all over the world that are a combination of cultural immersion, service learning and wilderness exploration. So there was a question posed about this supply and demand 
how do you really keep this intentionality of programming when you have students and a huge growing demand of students going on the programs who either are really excited about rock climbing in Thailand or saving the world, right? Because neither of those intentions are actually in line with what we're talking about here. And I would say that that's the perfect fodder. So that's actually really awesome that you have students who eagerly want to experience a different place. And in many ways, they have this romanticized other of that place. That's a really accessible starting point to then actually deconstruct how we've created the other. So really start to look at the stories we hold, whether that's a story of what poverty is, what it means to be from the United States, um, what we're doing there in terms of helping or saving, or are we coming alongside, are we learning from? So essentially, I think the assumptions in the demand and study abroad actually just start the first stage of the questions we wanna ask. And those questions are poking holes at the hierarchies that we have, the unconscious or sometimes quite conscious benevolent isms that we hold often when we're going in other regions in the, in the world. Next slide, John. So step one is how do we think about the other? But step two is really asking students, how do we understand self? And so once we've contextualized relationships for our students with the local communities, we then also need to invite them into a process of being more aware and reflective of their own identities and where those identities fall within privilege, power, oppression, and marginalization. So in large brushstrokes, identity development, this isn't using the formal terms, but paraphrased by me, identity development really moves students from starting at this place of accepting the status quo. So for some students, particularly those who are coming from a majority identity, that's actually often internalized superiority or complete sort of blindness to the power systems that actually impact their day-to-day -day life, right? For students of color, that could be internalized racism, internalized senses of inferiority, or for all of our students, internalized sense of superiority in relationship to the communities that we're working in. So acceptance of the status quo in terms of identity development is where we start. I think the really great news about identity development is the next stage is dissonance. So really crisis is a powerful thing, right? It's what we want to create because it helps students then start to really look at how they understand themselves and how to maybe challenge the stories that we've been taught. So that dissonance, that encounter is really facilitated through immersion experiences. It's why it's so powerful. And then they move into exploration and exploration often is people oscillating between resistance and immersion. So for white students that could be really rejecting the idea of racism to, to then considering and participating in communities that are thinking more critically about race. Um, for students of color that can often be wanting to be with communities that are share their identities to then actually wanting to go back to conformity because sometimes socially it's easier, right? So it takes a ton of different patterns, but again, immersion experiences offer that space to create that exploration if you're asking intentional questions, which we'll get to on the slide in a second. And then the final sort of general stage is integration. So how do you move your understanding of yourself into a place that has accepted the problematic stories that we've inherited and can, has made peace with the privilege and the oppression that comes with that, but then also moves into living and relating to people in a different way. So the great thing is that, and why, and why I gave you questions rather than the theory, is that really the way we support development is by asking questions. And so I think that our programs need to be really intentional for students' emotional development in posing these questions. And the first one is, who am I? Because when you're in that stage of accepting the status quo, you often have identities that aren't that salient, that aren't that relevant or apparent to you day to day. That could be because it's a privileged identity and that's how privilege functions, you don't have to see it. It could be, again, from this internalized racism where you've chosen assimilation and conformity to survive, right? And then, so the first question, who am I, is asking students, to think about themselves in terms of the social identities that get put on us every day. 
The second one is how have I experienced power and oppression along these identities? And that question is really what helps with the crisis, right? So it's not just who am I, what's my race, what's my class, what's my sexuality, but how does that impact my daily lived experience? So in what ways is my personal power conferred or suppressed because of those identities? And what's really great about immersion questions is that that question is supported by this next one. What does this mean for the program? And I think that's because really the best way to ask these questions and engage in this crisis is through relationship. And so it's often easy when the other is really far away to remain in denial. And we see this in our society all the time, right? But when you're now asking these questions about power, in the context of a, someone abroad who you've been thinking of in a certain way that's all of a sudden confronted when you realize your assumptions are in inferiority, or someone only two miles from your home, but who you weren't experiencing or knowing personally their lived reality until then, that really makes these conversations come alive in a way that is different than just an abstract you know, discussion of power. What, the next question, what do I do with this awareness in my life moving forward? So these last two questions are really about re-entry. And if you're doing service learning programs, particularly internationally, you need to be asking so what questions at the end of the program, right? And one of them is, you might be more passionate about issues including racial justice today. What does that mean when you get back home? How is this relevant to the issues in your own home community? And how can you be informed and active in those issues and communities? And then the last one is, how has my understanding of who am I changed as a result, or of who I am, changed as a result of this experience? So I love taking students on that full circle journey, where often during orientation, before you take students on a program, you ask questions around social identities, that you return to at the end of the program to say, what's more salient? What are you more aware of as a result of these experiences of people coming from different places and actually still connecting on this really human level, maybe through a different personal narrative than before? Next slide, John. So quickly, how do we make this an inclusive practice? I just have four things to say <laughs> real quickly. One is that this is everybody's work. Whether you're in a predominantly white group of students or exclusively white group of students or a very diverse, very racially mixed group, we need to be asking questions of identity. And really, I think the, one of the ways we make our programs more accessible if they are still predominantly white is that we do this work really well and with intention so that it is more relevant and the program is already more supportive and more attuned to the needs of the population before they even come. And guaranteed they're going to come when you have framing and you're engaging in issues that are gritty and real and feel connected to people's lives. The second one is that you really need to be aware of microaggressions and tokenization. So especially as your demographics change, you're going to see these issues not just between students and community members, but am amongst the group that you have. And how do you let that emergence also get worked? Which means be being really conscious of the issues, interpersonal issues that are coming up, and how different lines of identity are actually impacting those. And how, do you, as facilitators, do we really hold that? And then intersectionality. So making sure that as we talk about identity, we're talking about all of our identities that you can't just look at your racial identity without factoring in the way that your class, your gender also impacts your experience in the world. And the last thing is just to make this work holistic. So an assumption that I have is social justice work is really actually healing. It's healing stories that we've learned about ourselves that neglect or really harm the way we connect with other human beings. And so how do you not make this about teaching people the right scripts so they can talk about these issues in the correct way, but actually learning how to live past these stories that we've inherited into a more loving, equitable model, whether that's with the work we do in local communities, with our groups, or even within our knowledge and understanding and framing of self. Last slide, John. So with that, I just want to return to the definition we gave you at the beginning of what we mean by emergent immersion. It's an approach to community-based learning that's intentional in its framing, as Kira pointed out, 
rooted in relationship, as Chris spoke to, committed to self-interrogation and inquiry, as John highlighted, and mindful of power dynamics, both historic and present, that Rafiq and I spoke to you about. So thank you so much for your time and listening to what we have to offer, and we're now going to open up this space for questions. So Elaine? Great. Thank you all so much. And as you can see, John's putting up some of the resources that were um, mentioned throughout the um, slide um, presentation, the webinar. And um, while I invite you to, we have about 10 minutes left. So if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box right now and we'll get to as many as we can. And if we don't get to them, we can um, also respond um, after perhaps through um, email. Um, what we're going to do, and I'm just going to tell you about um, some of the follow-up while we wait and see if anyone has questions, um, you're going to get a link to fill out an evaluation and probably in there will also be the link to the YouTube channel so that you can come back and access this um, uh, webinar if you want to watch it again um, and then probably within the week we'll be able to once we get the slides from John and his colleagues um, they might have some last minute additions or some changes they need to make based on what was presented today when we get that we'll also send that out to all of you because we have your emails because you registered um, so I'm not seeing any questions come up in the Q&A um, uh, so um, I just let me quickly turn to the panelists and see do any of you have any final um, thoughts that you want to share um, there is the question of um, Alexis um, let me just really quickly Alexis I thought Stacy actually answered your question but maybe we misunderstood um, you talking about the supply and demand question so um, we thought that um, Stacy answered that in talking about the balance. That's um, so. If we didn't, please ask your question again and maybe clarify. And uh, Kara or Kara, um, the models do. So I'll ask the panelists um, if you feel it seemed like that the, these models required a faculty member to be present with the students. Can um, maybe Rafiq, you can um, clarify because you talked a little bit about the role of faculty. Sure. Um, it, there are lots of different models for studies abroad. Um, I find that in terms of student engagement, uh, the, the most effective models, frankly, uh, are the ones where they're faculty-led programs. So they tend to be uh, smaller programs or programs with enough representative faculty to really kind of uh, be hands-on with students. That certainly is a lot more work for faculty and for program leadership. Uh, but I think um, the, 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 the response of students or, and, and how students receive it uh, can be more powerful. It's also easier when you have um, faculty present constantly to really engage meaningfully with community. With that said, I, I've seen other models, larger models, where they have, for example, a significant staff presence. So faculty you know, are engaged in kind of the classroom part and are out with students on excursions, but uh, don't necessarily have to do all of the heavy lifting all the time. And, and for the larger programs, you, you definitely need to have uh, a good solid staff presence to deal with discipline issues and other issues that come up, uh, and also to help with kind of easing students into the community. One last thing I'd like to say in, re in response to that, um, one of the things that we've done uh, over the years with our Jamaica program is we bring students back who were uh, particularly um, uh, uh, engaged with the community as student leaders. So they do some of that work for us or with us in terms of getting students out into the community. It really helps us a lot. Thank you. Um, so um, another question. Oh, did somebody else want to go? Sorry, go ahead. No problem. So my program, we actually use an instructor-led model. And so these are mostly international expats who are fairly young um, in their late 20s to mid 30s who actually live in the communities that we're taking students. And we do design custom programs with universities or high schools because of the relationships that our instructors have. So I think remembering that it doesn't have to be faculty as much as having staff on the ground that are connected to the community and having that be a co-instructor model where there's someone from the local community and someone from the state to really cross that cultural bridge is another option. Great, thank you. 
Um, Alexis asks us another question. What are some of the issues you have observed with students from the diaspora where they are perceived differently than they see themselves? So does anyone want to address? My question would be for clarification in terms of diaspora. She's talking about the, if Alexis, if you're talking about like the African diaspora, for example, uh, or, or which, which diaspora uh, are, are you referring to? If you're talking about, I, I'll say just uh, by way of quick example, one of the things, we, when we have black students who come with us uh, to Jamaica, black American students, uh, you know, the, uh, their experience in Jamaica is uh, really interesting because for the first time, I think in most of their lives, they're, they're, they're among the majority all the time because Jamaica is a black place, but also, and then they feel very engaged and welcomed in that way, but also they, once they open their mouths, they realize that they are different and that their uh, Americanness often overshadows uh, their blackness in terms of their master status. So it's this really kind of interesting dynamic that John or I, I'm sure, could elaborate on. Uh, and, and from a professor's standpoint, uh, as John alluded to, it really does, um, uh, it places a new challenge on us in terms of negotiating different identities, uh, the different statuses that students kind of come abroad with because that can often be turned on its head. And if I could add to that, I think, you know, how we uh, invite students to take up this work is really based on what's coming up for them. Uh, I think that uh, if you are a, you know, a, a white student coming in and you consider yourself socially justice oriented and you like issues of sustainability and then you go take Dr. Muhammad's class and learn about the Middle Passage and, you know, you, different dynamics are opened up to you. It, it, it does give them space to kind of work something new, but also engage with what's already up for them. Um, I, I think that um, kind of touching back to the, our faculty required, I think leadership is required. And at uh, Rafik's point, we always have students go in and, and, and again, from the onset, if we're, students are involved or community partners are holding the space for our students, uh, if they know that this is an intentional part of the work that we're asking our students to kind of go through those questions that Stacy had, had outlined, I think we have uh, a real rich space for the students to do that work. Uh, I'd also say that students take up that work uh, in, in various ways. Uh, students will generally agree that, yeah, I totally want to do that. But as soon as you get them there in the country, they want to, you know, clean something or fix something or do something good right away i think you know that's part of our identities too as being helpers we can't just say like oh i'm not going to be the savior uh but not recognize that we're pushing in a pool for us to do that and vice versa with community partners who have been receiving uh, ngos and nonprofit support internationally for a long time it's hard for them to resist to make that initial ask uh, as opposed to us going in and having conversations and saying we want you to be co-educators and the, the last piece I would say is, is honoring the, our partners and their hard work in doing this work. You know, uh, some of the quotes that Rafiq was sharing about uh, them doing the learning from the, the community. Uh, what we try to do, um, not always successfully, but we're getting better at it, is trying to figure out how to uh, honor and value that work that they're doing. Because if we see them as co-educators, I think we need to start compensating them like co-educators and, and showing them that they uh, have a lot of value to our students. Because I also think when our students start seeing Seeing us do that, they realize that they are uh, an integrated, uh, real part of the, the class, not an add-on feature to it. Okay, any other final thoughts before we only have a minute or two left? Um, so any other final comments from the panelists? If I can just say one thing very yeah. quickly in response to Alexis's follow-up. Um, uh, I appreciate your questions, Alexis. Uh, it, we uh, at CSUSB, we are an Hispanic serving institution. 60% of our student population is, is uh, Latino. And we this year we have 13 students from CSUSB come with us to Jamaica. And one of the more uh, remarkable, mo most of the majority of whom were Latino or Asian, actually. Uh, and, and it was interesting just to, to kind of see how they experienced Jamaica in ways that were different because of um, uh, a lot of them have family who, a lot of them are children. They're all, or many of them are children of immigrants. And so, and they had been to their parents' homeland, uh, whether it be Mexico or, or Pakistan or uh, Cambodia. And it was just really interesting to see how they processed the Jamaican experience uh, in, in ways that were, that were similar to, but different from other students who've come there uh, in the past. Uh, because you know, they're not 
generally a part of the major kind of minority conversation, or at least historically haven't been in the United States where you know, they're mostly black and white. So I, I, we don't have time for me to elaborate on that, but I just wanted to acknowledge your question and say that uh, it has been interesting to see how different groups respond differently to their experience uh, in Jamaica. Um, Americanness certainly trumps a lot of other things though. Well, I want to thank the panelists one last time. Um, oh, Kara has one last question about do the students have a chance to reflect after they, when they get back, do they get back together? Yes, uh, we, all right, so very, the, their final paper requires them to reflect, but also we have a meeting, uh, at least in our program, we have meetings, uh, informal meetings where we gather all the students and let them kind of reunite and kind of, because they really bond closely while we're in Jamaica, but their final papers, in fact, the quotes that I shared in, in my part of the presentation were excerpts from their final paper, which involves a reflection component. I, I'd just like to quickly add that I, I think the, um, and everyone touched on it, and um, uh, you know, how, how do we bring this work back? We're all very interested in making sure that this doesn't just become an experience for a select uh, you know, group of folks. And how can the issues that you experience um, wherever we go, uh, you know, affect what we're doing on our campus? And a lot of the work is based on, uh, you know, mutuality and community building. And so, um, you know, we've talked about uh, this idea of you know, lots of folks feel like when they come to USD, US, you know, being here is an immersive experience. You know, going into our neighborhood uh, five minutes away is an immersive experience. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we're recognizing, you know, these ideas of meaning making, mutuality, community building that aren't just about, you know, um, space and time. And, and, you know, like the farther you are away, the, uh, the more that experience just becomes about that particular community. But how can you bring back some of the the, the energy and the passions learned in that group and apply it to what's happening um, at home. And I think, you know, Alexis pointed out um, in, a, in a, a comment in the question in the a q and a box that a lot of alternative break programs are using then local service projects before and after the program. And I always ask our students to come up with a social action commitment and plan. So one area that they've realized they're actually quite passionate about and then a plan of action in terms of what they're going to do to create change around that when they get back home, which often involves community engagement. And, and lastly, I think that that connection that we established, like again, we're practicing alongside of our students. Uh, so the relationships that are formed uh, between us as we're having these conversations uh, extend naturally kind of back home too, because you know, uh, when students really take up the work, they'll be in your office uh, wanting to continue the not just the community engagement, but engaging themselves in that inquiry and that self-interrogation of asking themselves uh, about their identities and how they do this work at home. So I think um, uh, that's the part that I think keeps me coming back for more and more is as being able to work with the students uh, consistently as they learn and grow that, uh, and as they help me learn and grow too, because I've got my own work that I'm happy to do as well. Well, I think we could probably go on. I thought we were going to actually get kicked off the platform. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I'm glad to see we didn't. Um, but thank you all for participating. All the participants who call, uh, you know, um, participated on the listening end and also submitted the questions. We were um, happy to have you join us. And I really do want to thank the panelists one last time. Uh, it was really, really great to hear more about your um, outstanding work and um, we will follow up with everybody um, and um, get you the links everyone out there and the evaluation and please uh, share your thoughts and any ideas you have for future webinars so um, with that we're going to end the recording and uh, and and officially end the webinar <laughs>